It's the Germany Experience, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. And this is the last of the 2019 reruns. Next week, I'm back in action with a whole new episode, 2020 episode. Uh, you can visit thegermanyexperience.de and I've made it easier there for you to get in touch with me. There is now a contact link in the menu and uh, I've also made it easier for you to leave me a voice message. When you go to the website, you'll see a little microphone icon in the bottom right corner of the screen. If you click on that, you can leave me a voicemail message of up to 120 seconds. Please get in touch. I'd love to hear your questions and comments and suggestions or whatever you've got for me. Just get in touch. Voicemail, contact form, I don't care. Email me, info at thegermanyexperience.de. Get in touch. Now, back when I was starting out with my podcast, I was on one of the Facebook groups for expats, and I saw a woman named Anna Noakes Schulze post on one of the groups that she'd done a TEDx talk. So I immediately reached out to her, but at that time, I hadn't released a single episode of the podcast yet, so I didn't expect to hear back from her, and why would she want to do an interview with me anyway, uh, if there wasn't any podcast ex in existence at that point? At any rate, she did get back to me within half an hour with a very solid yes. So we recorded the interview, but we had to wait a few months for the TEDx talk to be published before we released it. Now, Anna's TEDx talk was called Living Abroad Teaches Us the Power of Connections, and in our interview, she goes more into how the connections that we make with people shape our lives and who we are, even if we're far away from them. We also discussed the question of identity, one of my favorite topics, actually, and raising special needs children in Germany. This was episode 14, released on September 4th, 2019. Here's Anna Noakes Schulze. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, well, um, I, I grew up in somewhat unusual circumstances, although I did not realize it at the time. Um, my father was a, an immigrant from England who came to Montreal as a young man. And there he met my mother, who is French-Canadian, Montreal girl, born and bred. Um, but I mostly grew up in English-speaking rural eastern Ontario because my father had moved there for a job. And we were quite isolated there. We had very little contact with other family members on either side. And the first thing you notice is that this is already quite similar to a typical expat experience, even though I was living in my own home country, where uh, it's a nuclear family and the, the wider uh, relatives and, and family members are just not around. And years later, uh, when I was living in Bangkok, I started to uh, become interested in this idea of third culture kids. Um, and realized that not only were my kids third culture kids, but I was as well, even before there was a name for that. And what it means, these, these third culture kids, they're kids that are growing up in a culture that is not their father's and is not their mother's, therefore a third culture. And now here I am, years and years later, raising my children in Germany with their American father and their Canadian mother, and they are now second generation third culture kids growing up in Germany. So, yeah, so I think, um, you know, a key theme for expats everywhere and at every age is dislocation. You are literally not in the right place, or you're trying to find out if this place is the right place, or who are you in this place, and which bits and pieces of the various cultures that you've known can you stitch together into some kind of coherent value system that to you says home. So you live with this chronic state of uncertainty around your identity, chronic uncertainty around belonging. And often this uh, really shows itself in a strong desire to adapt to wherever you are and to fit into new environments. So you stand out automatically, but you'd really prefer not to. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think you very eloquently put what a lot of expats go through. Now, you've been... Uh, an expat in in several places. How did you get from Canada to Germany? Uh, it was a bit of a convoluted trail. Um, and it started with a fairly unexotic move, I guess, uh, because I left Canada to study for a master's degree in information and library sciences at the University of Michigan. And that was my first um, expat experience, you know, and it was, and it was, it was kind of a funny one in a lot of ways, because this is, 
for, for Canadians, you grow up next to the United States. They're obviously 10 times the size you are and, and massively influential in the world and, and in terms of culture and everything. And you feel like you know them. But then once you actually live in that country, you realize there's so much more to it than, than you realized. And sharing a few you know, TV shows and you know, comedians is, is not really enough to convey what that culture means. And, and, and in the case of the United States, um, a massively uh, diverse culture, depending where you are and who you're talking to. So that was a, that was a big, you know, my first big shock, my first big eye opener. So I was there for my master's degree. I started uh, doctoral studies in the same school. But at that point, I met my husband. And within a fairly short time of knowing each other, he got his first overseas automotive assignment in Coventry, England. And we did the long distance thing for a couple of years uh, until I went to join him. And that's where our two children were born. I didn't realize at the time that this expat life was going to be a long-term thing. We thought it was one assignment in England and then we'd move back to, to the US and you know get back to normal lives like normal people. And uh, it didn't turn out like that at all. So after, um, I think he was nearly five years in England and there were some tax implications, I guess, for companies that have um, expat employees longer than that. So it, it came to an end and we had to return to the US. And then something came up in Thailand and we'd only been in the States for a year and we just said, yes. So okay. off to Thailand, Thailand for three years, which was a dream, by the way. It was really a, really a heavenly experience. Okay. Uh, then crashing back to reality in Ireland. <laughs> Mm -hmm. for two years. Not such a great experience? Uh, um, I had to do my own ironing. Oh, I, I had to give up the maids, the nannies, the drivers, <laughs> okay. the yeah. sunshine and flowers 12 months a year. It's, yeah, that is quite a know, lifestyle change. Yeah, it was a big lifestyle change. And, and maybe in a way, Thailand doesn't represent reality when you're there on mm. a foreign assignment. Back to Ireland. And when we were in Ireland, I went back to work with my firm in London. And I literally flew to my job twice a week. So I, I got on a plane in Dublin in the early hours of the morning on Tuesday. And I stayed in the company flat for two nights. And I came back late on Thursday. And so my husband was holding down his job, getting the kids to school. I was flying back and forth to England. And then we had a chance for an assignment in Germany. And at that point, we realized our children were still crying about people they had known from two moves before. And that's when we realized that we couldn't keep doing this. We had to offer them a home. So we settled down in Germany, and it's been 10 years now, and the only home that my children can actually remember at this point. So I do sometimes feel like I envy people who know exactly where their home is, because for me, home is everywhere and nowhere. Right. Do, do your do your children now? This, this you say this is their home now, right? That's so they're feeling. Yes, and that was actually one of my questions to you with with this kind of lifestyle that you've led was whether you're going to is the, if this one is the one that's going to be permanent now. So, you, but it sounds to me like you've kind of decided that Germany is where you'll settle. Um. Well, it's you know what it's still kind of in flux. It's very very yeah. tricky because yeah. my husband is now working in Canada. He's in my home country. Right. And he's hanging out with my brothers <laughs> and our you, old friends and having barbecues with them. You guys do not want to keep things simple, do you? <laughs> you do not believe in the simplification of things. <laughs> no, no. And you know what? Maybe, maybe it would be boring. I don't it know. It would be boring. It would be boring. Is, too simple sometimes is boring. A bit, it's a bit too much excitement sometimes um, because this job in Canada is also temporary. And we have two special needs teenagers who've never known anything but the German school system. And one of them is only one year away from graduating and being able to study. And the other one just has two more years. So you can't just pull them out and put them in a, a completely foreign school system in Canada and say that, oh, it'll be okay because everything's in English. They've been educated in German the whole time. you know, And you just you just can't do that to them. So, but meanwhile, my poor husband... He's been sitting in the same job for eight years to give us this stability, to give us this home. But there comes a point where he needs a new challenge. And also, he's at a level where if you keep saying no, 
the offers don't keep coming. You know, so it was really important for him to make that step forward. And somehow we had to figure out if if we could do this. And we decided we could. So maybe you can tell me something about your your career path and the things that drive you today. Yeah, I think I think my career path has been absolutely hilarious, actually. So I studied long and hard to have a conventional career. That was the whole plan. And um, in the early years that I was married, I I did get a taste of that, you know, working in the digital agency scene in London. But once we started this relocation, you know, moving to the US, moving to to Thailand, moving back to Ireland, it became harder and harder to hold on to a conventional career. And then when I got to Germany, I thought, okay, Kajung stability, here it is. And uh, I assumed that, uh, okay, sure, I have a new language to learn, but, um, you know, my native language is a Germanic language. This is going to be so easy. Yeah, how difficult can it be? How hard can it be? <laughs> and, um, you know, and I got, you know, I was I was a busy little bee. I got right into the Volkshochschule, the VHS, BHS, we say, uh, doing these intensive courses. And it was like a half day every day to do these courses. And I hammered away at that. And I got after two years or less than three years, maybe it was two and a half, I got my Goethe Institute, say, Einz certificate. And at that point, there's there's no other courses above that except for the C2. And the C2 is literary. It's not like, let's polish up your German. It's like, let's take all the stuff you did in your English degree and do it all over again in German. And I don't really repeat myself. So I was looking for German mastery. But what I got is I went too quickly to the end of this whole series of courses. I got to the end. There was nothing more. My German is still wobbly, but I didn't have any more courses that I could take. And then even the German conversation courses became um, a bit problematic because here's here's the reality of the situation. You have 12, 14 people there, the students, who are speaking German very badly. And only one person, the teacher, is actually speaking German well. So most of what you're hearing is wrong. And you pick up other people's mistakes and bad habits that you'll still be correcting years later. So in the end, the reason that integration is so important is not just so that you feel at home in Germany, but that you spend time speaking with native German speakers, because that's how you're going to, to master it. Assuming that they're willing to keep correcting you, because I'm now at the point where I catch my own mistakes and I thought, uh, you didn't tell me that was wrong. I had to fix that myself. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's the state of things. And the reality is when you learn a new language as an adult, the chances that you'll ever have it completely perfect are pretty slim. Yeah, that's but, something I'm having to cope with as well. I think yeah. at this point, I've been here 12 years and I realize my German is probably not going to be much better than it is now. I just have to, I, I'm, I can still work at it and things, but I guess this is pretty much me maxed out. You might be maxed out and, and it will take a lot of effort to continue shifting it. I, yeah. I only regret that I didn't start watching TV in German from the start yes. because I would have had the flow of conversation. I might have even picked yeah. up some swear words, which I think is a gaping <laughs> hole in my, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, my it's always skills. useful. It's always useful to have a word or two to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very difficult with the colloquialisms, and I think that's the big thing that you learn from from TV shows and and things like that. But I I can't bring myself to watch a dubbed pro, uh, t movies and TV shows. I, I just cannot watch something that I know was in another language. Uh, in German, it just completely takes me out of the immersion of of the whole experience. Yeah, and you know that's that's the really tricky thing is is the dubbing is quite poor. Um, yeah, at least for television. I, for some of the for some of the movies, you might find there's some high quality dubbing, but for the TV shows, it seems like the same four or five people are doing all the voices, <laughs> yes. and some of them yeah. are completely inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was horrified when I moved to Germany and I watched The Simpsons in German for the first time. And That's I heard exactly Homer Simpson's what I was voice. Thinking of. And I could I couldn't I was like, I cannot I cannot accept that as Homer Simpson's voice. I'm sorry. I just cannot accept it as his voice. And so, Marge yeah, was all was wrong of, too. Oh, yeah, my, they're all oh they're all completely wrong. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 
So let, let's let's turn to the TEDx talk. Uh, and one of the things that popped out at me in the TEDx talk was uh, you said that after a while in Germany, you didn't know who Frau Schulze was. Uh, and we've already touched a bit on the identity aspect, but how much of a culture shock was it actually adjusting to life here in Germany? Um, for me, it was absolutely huge because I was already a veteran of expat life in four other countries before we got to Germany. And I I felt that I was more or less a professional at this, that I can come skidding in the door and assess the situation and adapt and presto, bingo, bango, I'm part of the new culture. And I, I really thought it would be that easy. But I think Germany was the first experience I'd had where a foreign language was as dominant in my life as, as it was. Certainly in, in Bangkok, Thailand, almost everybody that I had to deal with spoke English as well. So it, it's kind of a soft landing in a way compared to here. Um, and I had a, a, a really strange experience at first that I, I still can't even explain. I've got, to, I've got to get some linguist to explain it to me. But it was almost as if what I was hearing was very selective. And I heard English voices just fine all the time. And there's, there's nothing wrong with my hearing. I've been checked. But <laughs> German voices were tuned out almost automatically. It was like my brain was saying, that can't be relevant to me or they're not wow. talking to me, I literally didn't hear it. And people would have to get my attention, you know? And <laughs> so- Flag you down. Yes. And, and this is yeah. this is what I was saying, you know, when, when people would call me Frau Schulze, I, I literally didn't turn around because I'm not listening for that name. And I, I yeah. didn't even connect it with the fact that I was Frau Schulze. So that was the one, that was the one thing. And then the, and then the other thing, of course, is identity, which we, we touched on that, that once my career was on hold to learn a new language and I had a big difficulty settling my children into school, that sort of side of my life took over. And, and I thought, you know, I, I I seem to have ended up as a more or less a housefrau and uh, I didn't see it coming. So you had to kind of redefine who Frau Schulze was in Germany. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think this new Frau Schulze can be a good thing, but I I'd, I'd never had that experience where the identity that I thought I had didn't come with me. And then the 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 identity that I had in my mind for Germany also didn't match the reality and that was part of the the culture shock that I had as well mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. You know, everybody outside of Germany thinks of these sleek cars and technology yeah. and engineering, engineering and efficiency. Yeah. And yeah. so I come here and I expect a thoroughly modern country. And don't forget, I've come from Southeast Asia. It's about as modern as it gets. But then I arrive and I start thinking, why is it still the 1970s here? And why is there <laughs> so much bureaucracy? And why, oh, why are rules more important than people? Why is the internet yeah. so slow? I didn't understand <laughs> any of this. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. And yeah. there were times when I literally felt like like Don Draper in that scene in Mad Men when he's coming away from a barbecue in the suburbs and he's thinking, when I open my eyes, I want to see skyscrapers. <laughs> That's Frau Schulze. <laughs> yeah, that was me. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever tried to to research any particular topic in German. Probably you have, like you needed some information yeah. about some amp or, or whatever. And you do mm -hmm. these Google searches and these websites are total nonsense. They don't have the information you want or the information's wrong or it's out of date or yeah, it's a forum absolutely. where a whole absolutely. bunch of people who don't know what they're talking about are talking about that exact theme. And that's what comes up on Google. Yeah. And so you yeah, never get the exactly. sense that you can just go to the Internet and find the right information. Sooner or later, you're no. going to have to deal with a person. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this TED talk, the TEDx talk that you did, uh -huh. uh, that was in... It was in Dusseldorf, it was, right? It was. It was at the International yeah. School of, of Dusseldorf. And um, I guess the way I found out about it, it was it was connections leading to connections leading to other connections, basically. So the International School of Dusseldorf put on their first TEDx talks uh, last year, I believe, if I have it correct. So 2018. 2019 was the second time. And they put out a call for speakers and it turned out the theme was, how are we connected? 
And I thought, well, this is fantastic. That's something I can speak about. It's kind of my from, thing from the heart. Yeah. And you know, I, yeah. it never occurred to me to do a TEDx talk before, but I liked the idea of it. Yeah. So I I decided I would do that, and that that I had a message that I wanted to share with people, and that was the persistence of our connections to others. And that's the case, even if they're, you know, in our daily lives or not. You think about, you know, your parents and how influential they are for you. If they're still back in South Africa, you're not seeing them every day. You might probably not talking to them every day too, but they're still massively influential in your lives. And I was trying to share with people the idea, it's not just your parents. It's a lot of people that you meet along this journey and that everyone that you know basically becomes a part of who you are. Yeah. Even the people that, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to make connections with people, even if you think they're going to be in your life for six months, a year, they might go back to where they came from if they're another expat, because they still have some kind of connection to you. And I find sometimes people, there have been some people in my life who were a chance encounter where we literally just met and then didn't even live in the same city or country. And we are more connected than people that I see every single day. It's 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 very strange. You just don't know how those connections are going to form and bond. And the one thing is that they that they stay through through time. Yes, I actually met one of my best friends here in Germany, and about six years ago, she moved back to Melbourne, Australia. It's so so far away, and it's not like I can just nip in for a cup of tea like we used to do. Um, but we've kept up our connection, and I I I am looking for an opportunity to go back and, and see her. And as my as my boys get older, it becomes more and more likely that I can find a way to do that. I, I guess I didn't mention my boys hate to travel. They absolutely hate it. So I've been... <laughs> well, there goes that option. Yeah. So here we are living in the middle of Europe where we, you could do some amazing travels every weekend yeah, you could see if you so wanted to. And I'm stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for vacations? Just stay well, at home? Um, actually, we... There's one kind of trip that they can pretty much cope with, and that's trips back home to see family. So we go back to Canada. Uh, I think we see our Canadian relatives about once every two years. And um, as my 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 in-laws have gotten older, we've gone back about every year to uh, to New Hampshire in the U.S. where they live. Yeah. The, the the cousins are growing up rapidly, and the aunts and uncles are getting older, and the grandparents are getting older, and we we really feel the the loss of having more time with them because we're over here and so when we do travel it it's it's back to see family and and when i do anything other than that it's like a short business trip or i have these legendary girls weekends away <laughs> that i do with some of my <laughs> friends here and i've gotten to see a fair bit of of uh europe because we'll go anywhere that ryanair flies for the weekend and we just say that's where we're going to Sofia Bulgaria next weekend you know or we're going to Santorini next year or we've been to Valencia and and various other places or to Paris and uh, little by little we've uh, crisscrossed this continent uh, it's good to have that time for yourself to be with friends to bond uh, maybe get out of your everyday situation it's it's the, I find it's the best thing yeah and and I, I think we there's something very freeing for all of us because, you know, we all have, um, you know, some of us are working, some of us have businesses, some of us have a uh, full-time care of children, and we're always responsible for other people. But when we go away on these little trips, it's it's just us. It's just freedom. It's just yeah. a short little dose of freedom. And then we can, then we can go back to um, our normal lives and be perfectly happy with that. So you mentioned... I think in the talk at some point you mentioned Facebook. What what is your relationship to social media? Ah, oh, reluctant. Yeah, it's reluctant. Um, I I have not figured out how to get all of the benefits of social media while drowning out all the things that are not so great. And and I have uh, I have tried to wrangle Facebook in many different ways, actually. Uh, I have a few good tricks up my sleeve. I use um, uh, a social fixer to sort okay. of reduce some of the rubbish that gets piled into my feed. And is, I've, is that I have an app a, or what is that? Yeah. It is, yeah, it is. Uh, it is a uh, a Chrome extension, and it allows you to 
control uh, whether sponsored posts get shown to you. You know, they're basically advertisements. So I try to get the sponsored posts out. And I've managed to ring fence it in a certain way in which all of my all of my important people in my life, I have notifications turned on, but I have them unfollowed. So I don't see any of their stuff in my feed, but I get a notification. And if it's like a cute cat video, okay, I can skip that. If they're having a knee operation, I want to know about it. Or if there's a celebration or occasion. So I can do like a quick scan of the notifications and see what I need to look at. But my Facebook feed is mostly just informational pages about small business, about customer experience, about other things, things that I might share to my business Facebook page. And I've managed to completely separate these by, you know, by sheer effort. Um, And there's still a fair bit of rubbish in there. The key thing is that we all have to be really careful about how much time we give to this because it can be bottomless. It it is bottomless. It is, but that's yeah. kind of my my thing at the moment is is trying to find that that level. And uh, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna try that. Uh, what did you call it? Social fixer. What was it? Social fixer. Let me Social just uh, take a look at it because I'll I put that in the show it. notes as well. I'll I'll put the link in the show notes because it's... that's exactly the kind of struggle that I'm I'm having now because I find that social media is a great way of. Uh, of keeping track of some of those threads or those connections. Exactly. Um, and and, it, and especially to family, they, they, I, they have a bond or a, a connection to me that they wouldn't have had otherwise with me living on a different continent. So there's all of that that's really, it's developed a lot of friendships, but there's, it's also developed a lot of negativity. And uh, I, yes. I started realizing a lot of my mindset was was based on some sometimes the way that I was using social media, and I, I I needed to take a step back from that, and that's kind kind of where I am, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, I can I can speak to that as well. The 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 negativity that you will sometimes see, the the grumbling and complaining, and the outrage, you know, on social media can really affect your own mentality. And one of the things I wanted to say is that. One of the things I've become aware of since I've been in Germany is how dependent I was on the moods of others for my own mood. And um, when when you know people were mean to me in public or they yelled at me that I park like an idiot or I shouldn't dress my kids that way or whatever, it I really felt under siege, you know, and it and it brought me down. And there were times when I really just wanted to stay in my house and and not leave. And I think one of the good things is. I've become, I think, more emotionally resilient as a result of this, that I'm responsible. I'm responsible for my mood and I'm responsible for my happiness. It's nobody else's job, you know, and I've, and I've really kind of learned that by experience, you know, and maybe there are smart people who can learn that when they're 20, but it took me a lot longer. No, I don't think so. Uh, It's a good approach, but the problem is sometimes realizing what the triggers for certain moods are, because sometimes you're in, you have a certain I don't want to say mood, but a certain, maybe a certain behavior or a certain thing that's triggered by something. And you need to figure out that that trigger was actually coming from social media and, or some kind of negative feedback loop that you got involved in. So yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a love hate relationship for me and social media at the moment. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, you've, you've got to realize too, that in the end, it's, it's a mix of German and expat friends that you really need to have a healthy life in Germany because your German friends are the ones who are rooting you in this authentic experience of living in Germany. And they're really important. They're also your cultural translators when there are things going on that you just don't understand. They'll explain, this is how it works here. And you, you need that. But those relationships take time. Like I didn't even really have proper German friends in the first couple of years. I just had neighbors who were being nice to me, you know. And then on the other hand, you've got these expat friends and they can come and go, but they're generally quicker to make friends, quicker to laugh a lot of the times and quicker to to help you feel at home. And you need that in the time that it takes for your German skills to improve enough to have real friendships with Germans. And in the meantime, you've got to be warming your hands by the fire somewhere. And don't look to social media for that because you're going to no. burn your hands there. <laughs> yes. But I think that mixture of German German and expat friends is is, is true. And also don't rush it. Like if, if you find that you're not making connections with Germans fast enough, then I, uh, the thing we had to learn as well was just take, take, take your, your time. time. Just take don't be time. too much in their faces. Just, uh, you know back off a little and, 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 and wait for and it to you happen. you can't just glom on to them right away because it makes no. them uncomfortable. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to pace yourself there. 
Um, something that stood out to me about your story, because I have a son with special needs as well, um, and you've touched on it before already, but you describe in, in the, uh, uh, the, the talk a 10-year nightmare involving special needs and a school system not designed for accommodating difference. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about that nightmare. Well, it was, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, we were bound and determined to to integrate we 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 knew people who had um spent time in germany because of uh, work assignments and had put their kids in international school and uh and when they left their kids really didn't speak german and we thought you know it's kind of a we felt like it might be a wasted opportunity and that we should really go whole hog for integration we will put our kids straight in the german school system and uh and they'll be fluent and and we by some miracle will become fluent and we will be integrated and that was that was the whole goal um and then it turned out to be <laughs> the challenges just seemed to multiply from there for one thing i assumed that my husband was fluent in German. And um, so our kids are in the German school system. We keep getting these letters from the school. And I say to him, what does this letter say? And he says, no idea. I don't know. Oh, no. I don't know. You're supposed to be the German guy. He was supposed to be, you know, this. he was my German American <laughs> husband who had, yeah, who yeah. was, you know, unusually dedicated, you know, for an American unusually right. dedicated to learning other languages, had picked up some Polish, had picked up some French, and was fluent enough in German to to get this job. But he didn't understand, you know, Grundschule ease, <laughs> that's for sure. And, um, and the problem started coming up right away. Um, we were able to get a um, uh, one of these Ganztag Schule places where the kids are in school until four o'clock in the afternoon. And and for us, it was important because they would get more German that way. And and I couldn't help them with the homework anyway, because I didn't understand any of it. Um, and every day I would pick up my kids and the staff would be trying to tell me about this or that problem. And it was really kind of interesting in hindsight, because they had this sense that something wasn't quite right with them. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the case of my son with severe ADHD, that they they got that they understood that completely they were all over it uh and we started you know getting treatments and therapies for him but for the older one they felt like there was some sort of developmental issue but they they didn't have that they didn't have the expertise of course to diagnose it they they what they have is a really good sense of where the normal range is because they see so many kids over they the years, every day, so they've right? got a good sense yeah. of normal. But when something falls outside of what they understand to be normal, they're not equipped to diagnose it. You know, they can't do that. So I, they were pushing me to get my older son checked out and, and, and diagnosed it and find out if there was some problem. And I was getting pushback from the specialist that I was consulting. And they were saying, oh, he's a completely normal kid. Leave him alone. He just needs time and all of this stuff. Um, so I was getting it from both sides where um, I, I was told I was a paranoid mother, a nervous mother, um, you know, that I was just looking for problems with my child. But the staff were after me every day saying there's something not right here. And I got I was like I was caught in the middle and I didn't really have the language skills to to respond appropriately or to, you know, to be convincing, to make a case to somebody or even to extract the right information from from people absolutely yes. yeah and and it, yeah. it almost like it was almost like a puzzle i had to find the the right information to express the right way to the right person at the right time to get help and in the end my my older son was diagnosed with autism at age 14 which is quite which is, late. which is quite which is very quite late. late that is very late yeah although although i do know uh, this seems to be quite a common thing in germany because i also know another uh, expat who, whose eldest son was uh, also autistic, and they also I think they also picked it up at around fourteen or fifteen years old, right. and they had been backwards and forwards, and they were saying something is not right. So it it seems to be quite a common thing that that uh, that approach to kind of say um, no, everything's fine, everything's fine, leave let them develop, and we'll see where it goes. It should be fine in a few years, and before you know it, the, the kid's fourteen, and and that's when you get your diagnosis. Yeah, although there was a, a very interesting thing happened, you know, when as soon as we got the diagnosis, it you wouldn't believe how quickly people can just switch to working the problem. 
Like when you right. when you don't have a diagnosis, there's just a sort of general upset and concern and can't you speak to your son? Can't you talk to him about this or, or whatever? And then as soon as you have a diagnosis, it's like suddenly there's a framework for understanding what the problem is. And that that helped tremendously. And by then I'd sort of, by trial and error, I had worked up an entire team of people. There's a very, very useful service here in Germany called the uh, Schul Sociologische Dienst. So it's the school uh, psychological service. And they're the people you go to if there's um, a learning disability of some kind or a behavioral problem of some kind, or you need to somehow get yourself slotted into the psychological services in some way. They're like gatekeeper people and, and key holders to this mysterious German system. And we had um, an Anspruch partner, in, um, um, a caseworker in the Schul Sociologische Dienst who was fabulous and who was able to speak to me in English, which was such a relief because I was so used to being misunderstood. I had people seizing on the granular meaning of a particular word I was using, and I was trying to explain to them, this isn't the word I really want to use. This is just the closest I can get yeah. to what they, I'm trying they, to just say. Focusing on that. And they would really focus yeah. on that. And, and, yeah. and, and, and it was such a relief to just, after all this trying so hard to cope in German and to always do everything in German, to find someone where I could just just let down and say, could we just please speak English? It would really mean a lot to me. And and she was great. She she was really the person that set both boys onto the path of having, you know, the right medications if applicable, the right treatments, the right therapies if applicable. And because she under has a perfect understanding of the German school system and German healthcare system and how these referrals work. We we couldn't we couldn't have survived without her. She was just an incredible help. Okay, so then you got the uh, you, you got the diagnosis diagnosis, and then everything kind of uh, took took a turn for the better. Well, first they had to take a turn for the worse. So in the end, there was an important gateway that we had to pass through, which is a full a diagnosis of both of our boys uh, in a psychology clinic. And what had happened with our older son is just as he was coming into to puberty, so around age 13, 14, he seemed to be very, very depressed, very low functioning. His grades were dropping at school. The teacher said he couldn't pay attention. He would just stare out the window and dream. And he began sleeping literally 12 to 14 hours a day. So it started with this concern, how is it even possible that he's he's sleeping most of his life at this point? And uh, we got a referral to go to a, uh, there was an actual children's hospital with a sleep lab. And we got him into this sleep lab for, I think it was four or five nights, and he would be all taped up with sensors, and uh, they would uh, check the readings of him and we're trying to see if he had some kind of sleep disturbance. And it turned out he didn't. It was completely fine. It was like, it was almost like he was choosing to sleep that long. And so when we came up empty there, that's when he got referral for an inpatient treatment and diagnosis at, um, at a, uh, it's a Kinder and Jugend uh, Souchiatrie clinic. So it's uh, kin children and youth uh, psychology and psychiatry, so specialist facility. And they do things like, they deal with some pretty serious cases, kids that are suicidal, kids that are anorexic, kids that have, you know, major problems. And um, so we, we put him in there to get this diagnosis. And it took a full eight weeks that he was in there, really unhappy the whole time, wanting to come home. And and we were a little bit shocked by the atmosphere in the clinic because here we were thinking we have struggled and struggled for so long and now we're going to get answers. We're going to get help. We're going to get support. It's like the cavalry's coming, you know, but their attitude was that until it was known otherwise, we were the problem. 
if they didn't have, you know, if, if my son and then the other one who followed him a few weeks later, if they didn't have these idiot parents, they'd probably be fine. And these are mental health professionals. We're talking about people who should know better. And it, it's hurtful too. It's, it's just massively hurtful. You, you think you're going to be partners in getting these children well, and then you find out that they're, they're against you and, and they undermine you. And they, um, they misrepresent what you discussed in meetings, even though you have the notes, things like that. So you think the cavalry's coming, and instead it's the Visigoths who come slashing and burning, and now you've got to deal with them too. That's quite a pow- <laughs> that is quite a powerful metaphor. But you, I, can, I can hear that, that there was a certain amount of uh, – I guess you can say that you went through hell at that point in time because I, I know what it's like, like, as I said, with my son being special needs as well. I, I get a lot of what you're yeah. saying. Uh, especially the the stuff that's coming in German. The German reports we're dealing with a lot of the German language at times. Back then, our German wasn't as good as it as it right. is now. So there was a lot of things that we we didn't understand what they were were saying. And sometimes things were so nuanced or or so um, you know. You're really at a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it's 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 a really stressful thing because all you want, obviously, you you just want your kids to be okay, yeah. and if they're not okay, you want to you want to fix it. You want to like, how do we fix this? And uh, I can imagine if you feel like these people are working against you and not in the best interests of the child that you know you know your child better than any anyone. So we, I, we I, should have I been get... a resource for them. I would have thought. Yeah, because nobody knew yeah. them better. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, and in the end, we had these grave misgivings about the kind of care that they were getting and, and what the intentions of these people were. And we couldn't even pull them out. It, it wasn't it wasn't in our it wasn't in our power to remove them from that place until they said they were ready. You know, and in the end, until you they know, said they can leave in the end. Not everybody was like that. I, there were certainly there were two people I can think of who were really kind and caring. But for me, uh, it definitely raised some trust issues and and I've had them in other contexts as well where I I see people here who are working in what we think of as the caring professions who maybe don't come that naturally by the caring part. <laughs> <laughs> like you kind of have to look at them and think how did you end up working in this job how why? Oh that sounds like absolute I see I I I think the uh, term that you chose nightmare is quite apt yeah for and, and you, you know and this through. is not to negate the role of all the people who were tremendously helpful to us and supportive and kind and it wasn't just other expats it was germans as well german friends german neighbors german professionals there are good people out there and and and, and you know it's just like if you're out in public and somewhere and and you're just trying to do your bottle recycling and the senior citizens are hanging off their balconies yelling at you because it's the wrong time of day. <laughs> you know, I, I, I try not to focus on that too much. And I think about, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways we've been really, really blessed. And I think if, if you can't automatically assume that everybody is going to be nice to you, then maybe you appreciate it a bit more. I, I don't, I certainly yeah. don't take it for granted. And I yeah. have, you know, tremendous that's feeling of gratitude to everybody who's kind and yes. decent to me. Yes, that's a, that's such a good point. I, we we kind of, we, you know, what you, now that you mention that, it's, that's exactly right. Because when someone is nice to you, you just kind of latch onto them and say, "Oh my God, we are going to do everything together. We're going to solve everything You're that we stuck need with to me do now." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, maybe that's why the Germans are not so friendly to us. Well, you know what? It's it's. It's it's a it's a different approach to friendship, and I and I sort of get it, and I, I've I've tried to explain it to people back home because, you know, I was I was very shy when I grew up in Canada, and I was slow to make friends. But it's this whole experience of being an expat that's made me much more outgoing and much more quick to make friends. And so I was a little bit uh, taken aback when I first came here, and I would I would meet other women, and I would think, well, I'm a woman, you're a woman, of course we can be friends, right? That's how it works. You know, we got something in common already. And, you know, and they might want to, to, to zitzen me, you know, to, to speak, you know, in the, the more formal style with me, and they'd want to call me Frau Schulze. And this could go on for months. And I'm like, well, if it takes you six months to decide if you like me or not, I'm not sure if I'm really still warm to this yeah. friendship, you know? Yeah. But for, for Germans, it's almost like, <laughs> There's almost an approach to friendship um, that we Canadians would expect if we were told making friends with that person means you might in the future have to help them with their mortgage payment. 
you know, if we looked at it that way, we'd think, oh, I think I'll be careful here. <laughs> that's, ex- that's, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah. But I mean, it, yeah. but then at the same time, you know, it speaks to commitment as well that I, I, I think yes. when, when you do become friends, it really, it really does mean something and is maybe less of a there fluid a situation than it would be for us. Yeah. Maybe. And what I've found is, what I've found as well is it's, it's more with the, and when I say older, I don't mean that much older. I, I mean, let's say 40 to mm-hmm. 40 upwards. Um, I find that the younger people are much, much easier to make a connection with or much more open than, than maybe the previous generation, if you could you say You know, that. I'm sensing that as well. Uh, I'm, I'm sensing a little bit more yeah. openness and, and fluidity to connections. Yeah. That's what my kids tell me anyway. Yeah. And uh, for, for new expats coming to Germany, what is your advice to them to find those meaningful connections in a foreign country? Well, I think one of the things that, that we just touched on is, is realizing that um, you have to have patience, obviously, with your, with your German friendships and that the expat friendships might happen a little bit faster. Um, but I think the main thing is to find, find where you have points of commonality with others so that you can build a sense of connection around them. And there are a lot of things going on in Germany around their hobbies, clubs, sports, Vereins. Yeah. You know, um, there you can meet parents at the school where your children go, language courses or groups, any kind of shared activities. Because what seems to really help is just doing something together or having an interest that that you have uh, in common. And for me, the thread in every single foreign country that. I've lived in, except for the United States, is I've always done volunteering with the American International Women's Clubs. And that satisfied a lot of different needs I had, not just uh, social connection and activities, but also um, uh, charity activities as well, and sort of being aware of what's going on, where you live, and where you can make a difference. And that's that's been mm-hmm. huge for me. And uh, it's been absolutely amazing chatting to you i think you're very inspirational Thank you so much. and i i really appreciate your openness and willingness to share your story and people can get hold of you on linkedin right i can link to your linkedin profile in the show yeah, notes I, and and i do i do welcome new connections and um what a, and your website uh, the, it's it's your company website right sunflowerux yes. www.sunflowerux.com and there's okay. there's more information there okay Fantastic. Anna, thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'd love to talk to you again sometime. Thank you so much. We'll be keeping in touch. 